most of us would agree that despite, you know, looking different from person to person, navigating within that wilderness season with a good attitude and a good mindset can be extremely challenging. I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with a lot of the Bible stories where God actually took his people into the wilderness. The first people ever to enter into the wilderness was Adam and Eve. And then I think like the most popular story that I've heard during this pandemic is the um, story about the Israelites being brought from Egypt into the wilderness for 40 years. And I'm like, okay, 40 years, how many months are we in? Please, please, God, don't do the 40 year thing. That would be awful. (laughs) And then there's also Jesus. And Jesus willingly went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And back in 2015, I also willingly went into the wilderness of the Rocky Mountains. And it was amazing. But at this point in my life, when I was going into these mountains, I was completely swallowed up by depression. 10 years, just all consuming eating disorder as well for seven years. And despite me going to treatment, being on medications, you know, going to counseling, treatment centers, attending church, doing the small groups, like doing all the right things, I could not find freedom. And then like one day, almost like in a moment when I was in treatment, um, I knew God called me to the mountains. It's my wilderness. And it was for the same reason as the Israelites, for freedom and for the promise of a better land and future. Because the land I was living in was a land of shackles, and I was bound up to the identity of slave to my illness, that I couldn't receive the hope of God. I couldn't see myself as a victor that he said I was, that he says that we all are. So I followed the prompting of the, of the Spirit, and I made that courageous choice because I felt like there was no choice left for me. And I went out to Colorado to trade that slave identity for my true identity as a warrior and victor. You see, God has been been bringing his people into the wilderness for, it's, it's actually like him doing that is nothing new. It just looked different for every single story and it looks different for each of us. But the beautiful thing is that wonderful things happen from every single wilderness season. And there's beauty that's in store for each of us. Despite us not knowing what is next, we can rest in the promise that beauty is ahead for us. So for me, um, that wilderness experience brought so much compounding fruit to my life. Like not only did I climb 55 of Colorado's tallest mountains in 87 days, which is the equivalent to climbing Mount Everest over six and a half times when you add up all the vertical feet of that. And I found not only that, I found a way to freedom. And I found a way um, to, to freedom from my depression and from my eating disorder. And God has totally been using my mountaintop experiences to create this crazy, tenacious, um, go-getter, bold warrior within me. And I think the most beautiful part of my whole story is that how God continues to use it to um, inspire and help other people. So today, my story will serve the purpose of helping you experience victory in your very own wilderness season, one that you were kind of forced into, if we can be I'm honest. Sure I oh, that was Siri. Hi, Siri. But I think if you think about it, like God is sovereign and He is all knowing. And he is all powerful. He, he knows it all. He saw this all coming. And, if, and I think we all agree. And if we do, there is no such thing as coincidence. And God has a greater, a much greater use for this pandemic season than we can even imagine. But it's up to us to like try to figure out what that is. And if we believe that our God is truly for us, as stated in Jeremiah 29, 11, and if we believe Romans 8, 28, that says God uses all things, I love that, all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes, then there is absolutely something he wants us to receive in the wilderness. So how do we thrive in the wilderness? 
how do we make sure that we don't leave without the fruit of God's offering us in this pandemic? This is what we're going to do today. So we're going to discuss four ways you can equip yourself so that you can warrior up and thrive during this pandemic. Because I believe that God wants us um, to use the season to grow us spiritually and he wants to use the season to grow us in our character. And I believe that he wants to even grow our businesses. So the first thing we need to do to be equipped for this wilderness season is we need to know who Jehovah Jireh is. So for you guys that are listening, and I know, I think Bob's answered this and Aaron's answered this. So, hey, Russell, if you know the answer to this, go ahead and type that in in the chat box. I love it, Russell. No idea. That's so fun. Um, Aaron, do you want to do you want to tell us what that means and who that is? Provider. Yes. So Jehovah Jireh means God will provide. It's God. God has many names, but I think the one that we need to remember during this pandemic is where um, our finances are fluctuating all over the place and we're having to pivot and change and, and we're um, being left in a place of just not knowing what's next. We need to remember that God is our provider. And so, you know, too, like, why would I want you guys to remember that? Like, why is that my major point of this, of this talk? And it's because if we can remember that, it helps us to regain a peace of mind. And I think this world is so anxiety ridden, even Christians, right? And so if we can remember that, we're going to get back and regain our peace of mind. And if you have a peace of mind, then we can persevere and grow during this season. And there were so many instances when I was out in Colorado where God proved to me that I really could truly trust him and that he was going to provide for me. Just like he promises in his word, Matthew 6, 31 through 33 says, do not worry then saying, what will I eat? Or what will I we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All of these things. I love it when God uses all, all of these things. Well, let me tell you, God added so much more on my journey out in Colorado. Okay, so raise your hand if you guys have ever had a chest cold. Anybody ever had a chest cold? They are awful. Let me tell you, Aaron, they're awful and it feels like you cannot get a deep breath to save your life and you're like huffing and puffing and you're like coughing up a lung and it's just like, and then your chest hurts. Okay, so now imagine having that and trying to climb a 14,000 foot mountain. Put yourself there. Doesn't that sound like fun? And your reward at the end of your hike is to sleep on the ground in a freezing tent with a cheap sleeping tar uh, sleeping bag from Target. That's your reward. Awesome. So that was my reality um, at one point when I was out there. And here's the amazing part. A reader of my blog, because I blogged about this entire journey, paid for a suite at a hotel and for a hot breakfast so that I could recover. Like how amazing and generous is that? It's like so, you know, God using his people. Okay, so now I want you guys to imagine getting dropped off by a train in the middle of nowhere. And it is so cold that out of desperation, use an emergency space blanket. But all it does is make it worse because it leaves you now cold and sweaty. <laughs> and it's not just one night that you're out there. It's two. When I finally got back to that train, that took me back and I plopped my exhausted, worn out, aching body on that train. A tribe of strangers came beside me and like took me under their wing and bought me a, a hot meal. They um, got me a hotel night stay at the Hampton with them. And they gave me money to buy a legit, cozy, warm, amazing sleeping bag from REI. Like, that is, that is God's love. Like, oh my goodness. I'll never forget, like, that first night. Like, I was like, Hampton, what? Like, this is the most comfortable sleeping bag ever. And, okay, so this is the last story I'll share with you guys. And there's so many more that I wish I could share with you. But 
Another huge obstacle in my journey was that I, I had to navigate these insane mountain roads with my little Saturn SL2, SL2 Saturn. And um, I actually got really good at navigating, but nonetheless, because the frequency I was on these roads, I kept popping my tires. And at one point, um, my tire cost me, my third one, costed me $200 which was a huge chunk of my money. I was like living on a shoestring budget. Again, like I couldn't even hold a job before I went out to Colorado because I was just so sick um, and so um, depressed. And so every penny meant something to me. And a couple minutes later, after I was told this news, my mom called me to tell me that her coworker had, um, had told, had put, God, God had put it on her heart to write me a check. Now, guess how much that was for? Go ahead and just write it in the chat box for me. Guess how much this check was for? It was $200, Russell. <laughs> I wish it was, was that? $20 million. Yes, it was for $20 million. I wish that would have been amazing. <laughs> what I really want to get across and the reason why I share these stories of God providing is because I want you guys to know that God actually provides if we, and, and really it happens. We notice it. We see it, him working when there's a gap, when there's a need where we're desperate for God to step in. Let's not forget about God's power too. Like God is a God of power and he, he gives us that power and to give us the strength we need to get through any circumstance. And I think the, you know, even if we were to hit our worst case scenario, which for many of us, I think is go ahead and write what your worst case scenario would be of this pandemic, right? And so some of us are like in that space. Some people are in that space. And I, I think for a, a lot of us, it's like money um, is what makes our world go around. We need it. We need it to be able to buy food. And um, so it, it becomes this really massive, real fear. And I, I appreciate your vulnerability, Erin, on that. And something that I've been meditating on this verse um, on a lot during this pandemic is Philippians 4, because not only is it powerful, it's extremely practical. So let's read what the verse says here. Okay, so Paul says in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, he says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I, learn, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Notice how badly he wants us to like understand the contrast of situations. Like three different times, he's like, listen, like the worst, the best, the worst, the best, no matter what, I am content. And so, um, Paul talks about after this verse, he talks about what that secret is. So here we go. Make sure that you guys have a pen and paper handy because you're going to want to write this down if you want to live a life of contentment. This is what he says. Secrets to unshakable contentment. Number one, pray and ask with a grateful heart. Pray and ask with a grateful heart. And that's from Philippians 4, 6. The second secret, he says, to unshakable contentment, focus on the good. Focus on the good. What is good that is happening in our world today? Philippians 4, 8. And this last one is modeling Christ not just in thought, but in action. And that's from Philippians 4, 9. That's like one of my um, favorite Versus, like of all my talks, I talk about action all the time because it's not enough to know God's word. We have to live it and we have to walk it out. Now, I know some of you, I don't think I saw any, but may have rolled your eyes because this is so simple. <laughs> but, you know, oftentimes, and somebody said this on another call here, it's the most simple things that are the hardest to do. So if we did pray and ask, we did focus on the good, if we did model our life after Christ through action, we probably would be having an unshakable, possessing an unshakable contentment. Okay, so to recap, just point one, the first way that you can equip yourself for this pandemic 
um, wilderness season is to remember that God's very nature and name is to provide. And by remembering that, you will maintain or let's uh, get real, regain our peace of mind. Okay, so now if you have, want to uh, persevere and grow in this season, then you're ultimately going to have to um, have some confidence. And the world is full of advice on how to get confidence. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that my experiences in the mountains and God's word leads me to believe that the way, the true way to stepping into confidence is by awakening the royal warrior within. So let's look at the definition of what it means to be a royal warrior, because honestly, it is so perfect for the season, this wilderness season that we're in. So I was wondering, Bob, would you read this definition for me? You are an heir of God, Romans 8, 16 through 17, who is committed to taking faith-filled action towards fulfilling your divine purpose from Isaiah 6, 8. There are no mountains the enemy can put on your path that you cannot conquer from Mark eleven twenty three, because you know the power that resides within you from John fourteen twelve, and that God fights for you from Joshua 1, 9. Amen. Thank you. So did you guys catch that? There are no pandemics the enemy can put on your path that you cannot conquer because of who God is and who he has created you to be. The thing is about this royal warrior thing is people get really caught up in the idea of being a warrior. And I think that's because our brains have been imprinted of what a warrior should look like. I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's this. Hey, warrior, yeah. Rippling abs, he's got a scar because he's seen some, he's been some places. And some people rock that look, you know, but God needs you to know that you don't need the abs or the beard um, to be a warrior. It's, it's not about, you don't have to even present yourself a certain way. I absolutely consider myself to be a, a warrior. You know, I love mountain climbing and I love mountain biking all while wearing a dress and lipstick. Okay, maybe not. I love both of those things, just not together. But I consider myself fully to be a warrior. And here's the thing, because, and I think you guys know this, that being a warrior has everything to do with your heart. So everybody who's at home right now, repeat after me, whether you're on mute or not, say everything. But it has everything to do with our heart. And I just, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. And it's, it, it proves what, what I'm saying is true. If size, talent, and a title were qualifiers for greatness, David should have died at that battle. But he didn't. Think about it. We, we disqualify ourselves all the time. When I'm speaking and I'm going through this, like, figuring it out and what this is, I disqualify myself all the time. And we just don't think we're qualified. We don't have the talent or whatever. And so some, for some of us, I'm still on the battlefield, but for some of us, we won't even get on the battlefield. But God, you guys, you need to know, like God is looking for exactly, he's looking for you. Exact, he sees you in your fullness and your full design. And so when you feel like you don't measure up, he, do, he doesn't even see that. And he says, you are perfect. You are exactly who I'm looking for. And um, let's read in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, I love this. This is God's heart. Do not look at, on his appearance or on the height or of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And God is looking for those with the heart of David during this, even, even more so in this wilderness season. He's looking for warriors who are willing to obey their divine orders, who will push themselves out of their comfort zones and get onto that battlefield and, and go serve and, and um, minister to this ripe harvest field that we have right now. 
And so again, I just, you know, throwing in a little nursing joke here, like if you have a pulse, God says you're it. <laughs> and if, if you don't know if you have a pulse or not, can't find it, we can talk later because I still am a registered nurse. <laughs> so recap to our first two points here. So the first way we can equip yourself for the wilderness season is to know that God will provide so that you can have peace. And the second way is by awakening your royal warrior identity so you can step into your God-given confidence. Okay, we need a peace of mind and we need confidence to get through this wilderness season. Okay, and the third way to be equipped in order to thrive in the wilderness season is to identify if we have packed the victim or victor mindset. And there are so many thought patterns. This is something I'm passionate about because I was the worst victim ever. Okay, but um, <laughs> side note, but I only discuss, I will only discuss one um, for today because here, and here's the thing, because if we're thinking like a victim in the wilderness, you're either going to get lost, you're going to be like somewhere behind a rock in a fetal position, and ultimately you're going to experience a delay from entering your promised land like the the land that was promised to you you're you're going to be delayed from entering into it and so a key way to know if you are carrying the victim or victor mentality is by examining your emotions and whether you are predominantly living in a place of fear anxiety having a lot of struggles with worrying or a place of just feeling secure and um, steadfast Okay, and it's, um, don't get me wrong, it is totally normal to experience some worry and anxiety. And how could you not? We're human. We all need Jesus, myself included. But it is not meant to dominate our, our lives. It most certainly is not supposed to impact our choices we make. I repeat, worry and anxiety should not affect our choices. And I get so close sometimes where they do. And it's, it's okay. And God has space and grace for that. But because we are God's children and we do not conform to the patterns of this world, Romans 12, 2, okay, we, we don't respond in that way. We don't freak out when the pandemic hits and we and go buy all the toilet paper. And if that was you, it's okay. God has grace and space for that too. In the days when I, I want to tell you a story, when I was out in Colorado and when I, um, actually before Colorado, and I was struggling with depression, um, it always got the worst whenever I would um, pair a, a future that I wanted, like a future circumstance um, that had a deadline. And oftentimes I would just think too far ahead and I would become so overwhelmed by anxiety that I would completely shut down and become paralyzed. And my parents know on this, that are here on this call, like I could not, it felt like my, I was glued to my bed. It was so paralyzing. And um, so when I went out to Colorado, okay, so now I'm in a different environment. You can probably imagine that I had to deal with a lot of those familiar and intense emotions of fear and anxiety. I mean, come on. I had to, I, I, I chose, I got directed that I would climb 55 mountains in 87 days. And there's real dangers on top of that of climbing these 14ers. I mean, as it turns out, you guys, and you can probably think with me here, there are a lot of ways that you can die on a mountain. Here are some of the experiences I had while I was out there and the fears that I had to overcome on a daily. Um, there's this one picture that says danger. Many have fallen and died here or something like that. I was like scaling a wall without ropes because I thought I was stuck on top of a mountain. I could have easily just, uh, fallen to my death. And that, um, the one in the upper right is of keyhole. It's a beautiful photo. I love that photo, but it sometimes gets as windy as 80 miles per hour through that keyhole. And is so terrifying. I turned around twice. This was on my third attempt on this mountain. And um, it's been known that people have died because they've gotten blown off of the mountain. So there's that risk. And then on the bottom left, um, met twice, really close encounters with being struck by lightning. And I know several people who actually did get struck, um, not know them, but 
um, read through the news that over six or seven people got struck by lightning and one died. And then I had two bear encounters and still slept in my tent that night and God was with me. And you had to wear helmets on some of them because um, people have died from falling rock. And so then I had to wear a helmet. And then that last one, because I was trying to meet this deadline that I set before winter would come back, I was sometimes was climbing the mountains in sheer blackness. And so that's a picture of me on the summit with the sun now gone. And I had to go all the way back down in pitch blackness and just my headlamp and my phone light <laughs> to get back to my car. But God is good. I did it. And I always had this like uh, spot tracker, which if I got in trouble, I could just hit the button and the helicopter could come beam me up, which is a really great purchase from Ginger. Thank you, Ginger. In these circumstances, how, how did I get from a place of being paralyzed in my bed to actually moving forward in far actually life-threatening situations? And what I the first thing and probably the most important thing um, to my success in climbing was that I consistently focused my attention on the next step. My only next step, just the next step right in front of me. Like literally, where does my hand go? Where should my foot go? I planned for the mountain, planned to conquer that mountain, but I kept my attention on the step just in front of me. So again, in likeness, you plan for your end goal, but your focus is on the next step that will lead you towards that goal. And it is a powerful, powerful thing to do. And here's also the crazy thing that I learned um, from a book I'm reading. Actually, I finished it now. It's called Broken Escalators by Pastor, um, our pastor at Substance Church, P Pastor Peter Haas. And he found um, through his research, not his research, but other researchers, that anxiety comes from the same place uh, of your brain that helps us to think about our future. So if we think about our future and if we feel out of control and insecure about it, our reward for that is anxiety. That is where anxiety is born and why, why we experience it. So does that sound like anyone on the Zoom call today? Comes and goes, I'm like good today and then the next day. So it's a, it's a fight and I understand that. But you know, so while like yoga instructors and therapists and the, the monk, like the Buddhist monks, they're all saying, you know, the cure to anxiety is to just stay present. And like, the, and the reality is, is we can't do that. But why? Like, why is it so hard for us to stay present? Um, and, and like, why can't we just choose to like do that? And some people do, right? But it's because we were designed in God's image. And part of that image is God as the creator. He creates. Therefore, we also create. He plans. We should also plan. He dreams. We dream. So what is the solution? <laughs> How do we live a life of peace and not of anxiety? Do you adopt a narcissistic uh, mindset like the world's richest entrepreneurs? No, I think we have enough of those. No, the solution for you and me, it's, it's right out of the Bible. And here it is. It says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. First Peter 5, 7. And it sounds easier than done. I know, I know, I know. But today I even have a potato analogy for all of you that I will hopefully help you apply this concept to your life more easily. So here goes nothing. Okay, so imagine, here's my, and they're not just potatoes, they're sweet potatoes, which are far tastier and have more antioxidants. <laughs> but so imagine that I'm walking on um, God's perfect path. Okay, I'm walking on God's perfect path. And, you know, I see these potatoes and I pick them up and um, we're going to call these potatoes control. So I pick up the potato of control and it's like hot. It's like, oh my gosh, hot. This is hot. Oh my gosh. And it's like a game of hot potato. And now you're like trying to walk down the path. But this thing is so hot and it, all it's doing, you think you're in control of this potato, but all it's doing is it's burning you. And it, you're actually not controlling it. And it's making you anxious. 
<laughs> and and God forbid if you actually dropped it, like mental mental breakdown right here. If you drop this potato, if we think that we're supposed to hold the potato. So what we're supposed to do is we literally need to play hot potato and pass it off to God for him to control. We need to pass off the control we're trying to have in certain areas. And we need to just lay it down and say, God, you, you have it because God's hands are way, 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 way more capable than ours. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Like we, if, if we, um, put down the potatoes, put down the control. Okay. Then we can, we're, well, one, we're not getting burnt anymore. So that's, that's nice. We're not getting burned by the world anymore. And we can focus on the path again, because we're not focused on this potato of control and we can experience God's best for our life. Okay. So, you know, I, I hope that helps illustrate it. Lay down the control. So ask yourself, what miserable potato of control, there we go, do I need to play hot potato and cast onto God? And what is the next step God is asking me to take for my business and career? Okay, so let's recap the first three ways. Okay, so first way to equip ourselves for success in the wilderness was to focus on God as our provider in order to find our peace of mind. The second way to equip ourselves was by awakening your royal warrior identity to find confidence. And the third way to equip ourselves was to adopt a victor mentality by releasing control. It sounds contraindicated like for the world, like, wait, you're, if I release control, then I'm actually a victor? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and that's gonna help us to be able to stay focused, again, focused and moving forward on God's perfect plan. But um, there is a fourth. And, and, and it's a really short one. This is kind of me closing up the talk right now. And it was so important for me um, to do this. It's most like arguably the most important one that helped me to climb all these mountains that pushed me to do it in 55 or 55 and 87 days, helped me conquer the eating disorder and depression and served this fourth point served as the catalyst of me really accepting and adopting that royal warrior identity. And it's this, ultimately, who you want to be in this wilderness season, because we're here, how you want to come out of it comes down to you making a choice. Your ability to thrive and to find victory in the wilderness until it, it ultimately comes down to whether or not you will make the choice to act on God's word and to implement the things that I have talked about today because they were proven and they continue to be proven on my journey in, in the wilderness that I'm in and it can be for the wilderness that you're experiencing. If you have, a, if you can pivot your heart and open it up to the idea that being a royal warrior for God's kingdom, like I have done ever since I was in those mountains, I believe 100% that you will persevere in your business and it will grow to new heights. But what is going to please God the most will be the fact that your journey and your obedience will become a powerful testimony and inspiration for someone else, just like mine was. So thank you. That's my talk for you guys today.